Hi, everybody. Welcome to We've Got the Beat, the podcast devoted to teen entertainment from the 80s and beyond. I'm your host, Michael, and Mindy's on the other side. Hello. I'm not giving myself a cookie for getting it right. <laughs> it's a miracle. <laughs> you're, you're, well, don't get too excited. You still have a few things to say. Oh, no, I'm sure I, I will fuck this up so hard. Um, so it's been a bit for us with an episode kind of stretched out. We did that uh, teen pop episode as a filler which actually sounded way better on my phone than you would ever expect i'm actually shocked um i was also thinking that that was uh that was well received that we should do a uh pop punk episode because that was from that same era aimed at teenagers to get them introduced into harder rock okay just just throwing ideas out there but this episode is the long delayed one where we said we're gonna do back in january where it's uh can't buy me love and she's all that and uh, I had a lot of fun watching these. I love makeovers. <laughs> Here's the weirdest thing. I'm gonna. I just want to skip ahead real quick, just to say this. She's all that. Really hard to do a parody of it because we did a, not another teen movie. And I, there are moments in she's all that that's parody. It's it's so clearly a spoof of itself. Yeah, I can see that. So it's yeah. really, really hard to do a parody of a parody. So I don't... I mean, that's the same thing with Scary Movie, though, is that Scream was poking fun at slasher films. I don't mm-hmm. get that. You're supposed to make fun of movies that are, like, full of themselves. Yeah, uh, no comment. I don't know. <laughs> All right, so that that brief segue over. But let's go back in time to Can't Hardly... Ugh, I can't Hardly Wait, damn it. <laughs> can't buy me love or as i like you to don't joke, get your cookie now <laughs> damn it <laughs> and oh what? there's something in my pocket i think i have food in my pants pocket is it a is it a cookie it is not a cookie it is a piece of bark from me working on the lawn today <laughs> Ooh, ugh, I'm well, edible edible and delicious <laughs> um can't buy me love or as i like to joke can't buy me blood because i take every song with the word love and i replace it with blood <laughs> um Sounds about right. This uh, this held up so well. I was actually shocked because most '80s teen movies are exhausting and cringeworthy at times. Yeah. This takes from the uh, John Hughes school instead of the Porky school, which dominated the first <laughs> half of the '80s. Yeah, that's they're very very different schools. Thank goodness. Yeah, I mean it's more sensitive, more thoughtful, dialogue oriented, better characters. And uh, there is a little bit of, like, naughtiness to it, but it's clearly, like, PG-13. And this is from Disney, um, their touchstone division, and so they're not, they're not going to go the Porky's route, thank goodness. I mean, most of the naughtiness is, like, doing pulling dumb pranks on each other. And yeah, stuff. and then there's sex in it, but they never show it. They just kind of, like, it's, like, off to the side. Hey, well, teenagers have sex. That's the way it is. Yeah. But um, this is really a breakout for uh, Patrick Dempsey, and it's kind of sad that he didn't have a whole hell of a lot after that. Like, you look at the movies he, he had. Well, we saw Loverboy, I think, a few times, and we really liked it, but it was a bomb. I can't think of anything else that was successful for him for years to come when he became, like, a support. It became hot. Well... Yeah, I mean, really, he wasn't respected in, really until Grey's Anatomy. Yeah, well, we Scream, whole... we, we discussed in Scream 3 when all of a sudden everybody's like, where have you been and when did you get good looking? Yeah. Yeah, the and lankiness whole... didn't help. And the whole thing on Grey's Anatomy is about how dreamy and good looking he is. This is a side note, but I didn't know that uh, he had a racing company and that he was actually in a lot of car races he oh, stopped in 2015 I, think I, I remember now that you say it i, I kind of do remember it but wow. not that i not that i know tons of things about him how the office. hell does that come up first before his acting career <laughs> seriously yeah it's on his they're wikipedia like, oh, way yeah. before his acting they're like oh by the way he's also an actor yeah bizarro um yeah so i'm looking before this he had only been in the uh the Fast Times at Richmond High TV show for six episodes, and then he was in Meatballs 3 playing Rudy as a teenager right. being helped by a dead porn star <laughs> that, that haunts him. <laughs> okay. Yeah, weird. 
Yeah, and then it just it went uh, Lover Boy, Happy Together. No one saw that. Coop Deville. No one saw that. Mobsters. Mm, run. And then that you know with honors. Well, there's with honors and outbreak, but those are supports. Yeah. Those, yeah. Um. So directed by Steve Rash, who had done the Buddy Holly story, which I think is funny. If you look in the background of Can't Buy Me Love, there is a scene of of. Uh, uh, Buddy Holly playing on the television. I thought that was kind of a fun homage to his own stuff. Hmm. Uh, a I big, think I remember that. A big hit, $31 million. I think it cost six. And this is one of those that wasn't just big in theaters. Everybody we knew had seen this movie. This was a huge video play for years on end. Si, senor. <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure what to say. Sorry. I'm just, yeah, uh-huh. I don't know. I, this movie came out in 1987. I don't remember anything from yeah. hardly from the seven, or from the 80s or the early 90s. There's very few things I remember, so it, I'm just going to trust you. What I what I appreciate about this is not it's not set in L.A. It's not set in a, a city that you always saw in New York. Uh, Chicago and L.A. are the ones that you usually saw in movies back then. And this one's shot in Arizona, which is kind of unique for the genre. Hmm. Don't have too many movies set in Arizona. No. And um, so let's talk about the cast real quick. Uh, of course, we talk about Patrick Dempsey. This is his breakout role. But we also have uh, Amanda Peterson, sadly, passed away too young. Um, we have a young uh, Courtney Gaines who had just come off. No, no, he hasn't been in the Burbs yet. That's for another year and a half. He had come off no, of... No, uh, right. Uh, Children, Children of the Corn. The corn. Yeah, where he screams, Out, Linda! Out, Linda! <laughs> but he, the one that cracks me up in this is, you remember Rico Suave? How could you not? The song? Yeah. The song? Yeah. Yeah, uh-huh. Uh, that was uh, done by Gerardo, who is actually an actor in this. He's Ricky, the good-looking uh, Latino guy uh, next to Big John, which is the big blonde guy from Major League 2 and 3. Oh, wait, that's strange. Yeah, he was an actor. It was all meant to be a joke, and somehow it ended up owning his career and then, of course, ending his career. Aw, how strange. Like, I really I'm have to go back and look now because I'm like, I, I'm, how, have, I'm having a hard time believing you. No, it says it right here. But, um, <laughs> yeah, when I saw him, I was like, so wait weird. a second. Uh, yeah, he uh, he's what? In Ecuador, he's called the Latin Elvis. Um, hmm. No. I'm not sure I'm buying into that. Wow, he's had a lot of albums, considering. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, eight albums. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> um, and we also have young baby face, rat little pain in the butt, brother Seth Green. Seth I, this Green. is the first time I think all of us had really seen him. I definitely remembered him in this. Yeah, and uh, the fart jokes. That's that's as filthy as it gets. So I'll, I'll take that over anything else. Wait, no. Technically, there's a poop. You do poop at my house. Uh, I think I just like how he decides to mess with him and, like, it somehow convinces him that the National Geographic is, like, MTV or whatever. Oh, yeah. <laughs> in the, the, the dance craze, but that it he didn't even embarrass himself, which is still not cool. Yeah, the uh, that's a gag that was reused again in uh, Encino Man, and it, oh, yeah. she's all that has a, an impromptu dance scene, which makes no sense whatsoever. How everybody just choreographed like that, <laughs> but this one is like they actually treat it like what the hell is happening, and then they're like, "Well, this is new and this is weird. I'll, let's do this." I mean, at least that's a little more organic. Well. There's multiple dance sequences. Like, I mean, the organized group dance at the prom or whatever is so weird because... Sorry. Technical well, difficulty. Okay. I was like, all of a sudden I went dead silent. I was like, what's happening? <laughs> my, my earbud popped out of my ear. Um, just because it's weird. But... Then there's that random dance sequence with like Matthew Lillard where he just like goes no. crazy. Give it to me, girl. Like, <laughs> I mean, to me that's like more believable than the prom because he's just crazy and egocentric, you know? Yeah. I don't know. But whatever, let's just bring on the weird dance sequences. Yeah. We love it. 
The uh, and the last thing I'll say about the cast is young Amy Dolenz, who would uh, get her own starring role a couple years from now in uh, uh, what is that one where Tony Danza is her dad? She's out of control. She's out of control. Thank you. Uh, sadly, really didn't have much of a career, but boy, she's adorable. <laughs> she really is, and I feel like we were at some point going to talk about that movie too. But we just oh, we will. It will. It'll come eventually. We're just always trying to find a good pairing, but I think eventually we're going to run out of good pairings and just like just random. We're just going to pick like a year and whatever's left over from that year. You know, like oh, these are leftovers from '89 yeah. or something. I don't know what. Um, Ma- Max Perlick too is in this. Yeah, and, you know, he's just. In so many things, he's such a you know character actor. They and he just he just keeps showing up, and I just keep thinking, oh wow, he was acting this young, you know? Yeah, well, that's mostly when I know him. I I remember that they were going to do a spinoff of Buffy with Anthony Head. What was it called like Slasher or something like that? Remember they were talking about doing a BBC production? And well, Ma- he. He has a, his. They also there was a whole thing where they called him the Ripper. Ripper, that's, that's a, it. That was his nickname from his younger days. Yeah, and Max Perlich was going to be the co-star because he had done a small cameo as a different character from his past on Buffy. Right, I remember. Yeah, but let's get into the the meat of the movie real quick. Um, originally called Boy Buys Girl. Uh, thank God they changed the name, but it's it's a shock that they could even get the Beatles song because I feel like they were pretty tight with like letting the songs out there back then. Yes, maybe this was the first win. Yeah, um, I really get the uh, there's a chunk of this movie, especially towards the end, where um he talks about how none of these classes. You know, the cliques mattered when they were kids. And that's when they all knew each other. They all grew up together. Yeah. That That's the interesting thing about this is that he was never an outsider. You know, he wasn't some kid who just moved there, which is kind of a, a thing they pull in a lot of these movies, like Crowded Kids, stuff like that. And he's like, we were all in, like, elementary school together, and there was none of this bullshit. And, you know, we helped each other, and we were, you know, friends. Why does it have to change? Why did why did you decide one day that you needed to be cooler than everybody else and start you know, separating and and that's I think unusual uh, and honest. This feels like it was written from someone's own perspective of high school. Yeah. You didn't really have to suffer too much from not being cool. You had your own group pretty locked in, but I you know of course I suffered badly for years. And I really relate to his character because I did some stupid things at times to try to be cool. And thank God I, I kind of just gave up and just decided to be me. And that's when I started to get my own my own group. Did you know people like this who would make huge mistakes or identity crisis kind of stuff to try to fit in? Um, I mean, there was people who tried too hard. I, I mean... I don't know. I don't know if they did like massively embarrassing things like this, but but at the same time, like I mean, I think that I just was doing my own thing, and it just I was lucky that it worked, <laughs> and that yeah, I had a like a solid group of friends, but I just knew a lot of people, and yeah, uh, <clears throat> I guess I just didn't really care, but I was involved with a lot of different things, so I had a lot of you know different relationships and new different you know just by being busy and do being active that i i think i just saved myself from yeah i think i think that was my I problem know. i didn't do the group stuff i didn't join anything really except for what was it today that we were just talking about dmla yeah. how i was in that group yeah i sent that to you yesterday and i was like i did not know that that still existed no, but yeah i mean i did like you know, theater and choir and the French club and, yeah. you know, I still, different things like that. I was just active. Yeah, I don't know why I didn't get involved in theater. Well, I was in radio, though, but that was such a kind of isolated thing where you're just a very yeah. small group of people. So that's not the same thing. Yeah, radio is a is a is strange, but it is a you're connected to it seems like you would be connected to so many people. But in reality, it's just you in a small space. Yeah, and your co-host. You always had a co-host unless you were really, really good. 
I mean, like, and I'm just saying, like, in our like radio station, it's just like one person in a booth. For yeah. Hours, and once in a while, you'll have like a guest come. Yeah. To talk to if you. if I could do it again, of course, I probably would have tried some more stuff. But for you know, it was just it was church and radio, yeah. and that was about it. And we had a very small church, so I didn't really have much of a social group. And I just remember like. I desperate to fit in and I did stuff like Robbie and I could see myself in a situation like he would where he you god this is embarrassing but it's the truth I, I that I was so desperate for attention from certain people that I I would not be surprised if I would try to buy my way in yeah I mean it kind of just it just depends on the situation and you know when you were got kicked on or were given a hard time and you just like would love to have made it stop yeah and and it's not just nerdy people though people do it all the time you see i mean what do you think uh, like a, a social clubs are golf or uh, what do you call them uh, clubs are you know they're just like oh i pay this huge membership fee and i get to hang out with these elite people <laughs> that's kind of that's what a fraternity is you know sigma by yeah. my friends was always the joke oh yeah the, uh, yeah, I think that it doesn't really matter like what you appear to be. Most people are are still trying too hard. Yeah, and and Ronald Miller fucks this up so bad halfway through the film that you want to punch him in the nose because there's that thing where Cindy's like, well, you know, this is actually turning out to be kind of good, and he's not listening. He's not listening one bit whatsoever. He's not reading her. Uh, and then he's just like, well, the deal's off tomorrow, so we'll go back to blah, 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 and I get to live this world. And I was like, you dummy, pay attention. She actually likes you. And proceeds to just go from person to person to person and becomes so full of himself and ditches all his friends. He deserves his come up. It's so bad. Yeah, he does. He really does. Yeah. He just was such a D-bag. But I think it's a little more... Um, of a challenge for the writer to do something to that main character because to take away all sympathy and switch the sympathy over to the other character is an interesting uh, feat to do because the audience sometimes isn't accepting of that. Yeah, I mean, isn't it kind of the point to say like, oh, you know, people are more complicated than you think, and oh, when you put these two people who are complete opposites together, then they learn from each other and grow. But it's like, he like took 12 steps back before he could move forward. Right. And, you know, the fish out of water thing um, was handled you know, in a different way, because Steve Rash did uh, Son-in-Law six years later, and I think that he had a similar setup. But he broke it down differently, and, and I thought that was a really interesting thing for him to do. I, Steve Rash really isn't a known director at all. I can't even remember what he did besides you know those three movies I mentioned earlier. I think he does a bunch of directed video movies for Universal. You know, like those Bring It Ons in American Pie, I think, which is kind of a shame because here he shows a lot of talent. Yeah, absolutely. It's not visual, really. You know, it's not like some fancy you know uh, direction or anything like that, but it's how he does the characters I think he handles very well yeah I mean I think it is it is a a, a big decision to take your hero the hero of your story and kind of turn him into a villain and then redeem him at the last minute yeah or whatever I mean... He's a coward, especially in that scene where um, he goes to throw poop on his friend's house. He knows damn well yeah. what he's doing, and he's such an asshole about it. Um, yeah. yeah, so take him, the villain. And, and <laughs> if this was a comic book or a TV show, he would have been the villain for a while and had to work his way back for redemption. But yeah, they don't have that they much They didn't make him work hard enough, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it takes time sometimes to do that but you know i think the director did a good job of that too because he only has like 15 minutes to to, to flip that back to good mm -hmm. all right i don't have anything else to say about that do you have anything nah. did you ever see the remake love don't cost a thing um i think i probably did but uh it certainly didn't make an impression on me if it did, it, it was only enough to, like, never watch it again. Yeah. 
Uh, when I when we first moved to California, I started working at the Golden State Theater in Monterey, and that was the very first movie that premiered when I worked there. And uh, it was in the big. You, you remember the big theater there? Yeah. Nobody. <laughs> it was like twelve people for the debut show, and I was like, "Oh, that's not a good sign at all." <laughs> Literally, the only reason why I would consider watching this again is because Kenan Thompson and Cal Penn are in it. Oh, video. okay, yeah, I didn't know that they were together. Oh, wait, you said Cal Penn, Kenan Kel. Sorry. Yeah. Oops. Sneaky, um, sneaky. I was trying to find a movie to co- <laughs> combine with Good Burger. Damn it. <laughs> Um, I mean, let's just do it. God damn, I love Good Burger so much. I know that's not the, the topic at hand, but it's yeah. a good movie. No, no, we'll, we'll so find silly. something. I'm sure there's something out there that will go well with it. Uh, some hey. fast food restaurant thingy. Um, so our second film is She's All That. And no, I did not watch He's All That. I don't have Netflix, and it also just sounds like something that I'm not interested in. Did you watch the remake? No, I, I don't think I can bring myself to do it. Yeah. I just don't think I can. This was heavily mocked. Um, for a long time you know it's like one of those oh this is cheesy stupid pandering to teenagers and I just watched it I'm 45 years old and it was not nostalgia blinded me it's a good movie it, I really legitimately liked it whereas the other movie I was we were watching <laughs> whatever it takes <laughs> it was a big bag of shit <laughs> the nostalgia yeah, eyes rough. were my glasses were not on yeah that was a toughie not one that I wish yeah, and, and sadly, Rachel Lee Cook and Freddie Prince Jr. now are kind of, like, dismissed, especially Freddie. He was thrown away so fast after this. And I don't think it's because of his performance or this movie. I think it's what they gave him after this is what flubbed it so yeah, bad. Yeah, maybe. Come on, Wing Commander. Come on. We still laugh about that experience in the theater. <laughs> Goddamn. What a ride. What a ride. Opening weekend. <laughs> Three of us in there. <laughs> and. I mean- no, is it? We're just mocking it the whole time. It's not like he, he is, that has been doing stuff. He's been doing a lot of voice work with Star Wars Rebels, uh, Bad Batch. Uh, he has a Christmas movie coming out at the end of the year. Uh, it's not like he's not doing anything, but mm-hmm. he, I mean, but I get the Well, he also it. purposely, like his wife, they walked away. They didn't want to consume yeah. their lives. They saved up their money and they raised their kids. They're and they doing stayed. other things. Yeah, they stayed he wrote together. A um, but I'm just looking at what he did after this because we're never going to discuss him on the show. Is uh, Wing Commander down to you, boys and girls, head over heels, uh, and well, we might do Summer Catch because I'm a sucker for any baseball movie, really. Yeah. Uh... But yeah, you're right. I mean, they you know they both have ventured into other things and like have been pretty successful i mean he wrote a cookbook she has you know a, a company you know that she you know it's probably several things they have there have invested in and, and are, you know have other lives now yeah um rachel lee cook sadly almost crashed as fast as she rose and no she's not related to us but um i keep looking at what they did after she's so and I, pretty is she is she's adorable um, I think she's so adorable in this movie, and I was just like, but it's also really hard to believe that she's a nerd until you hear the dialogue that comes out of her, and I can see anybody, mm-hmm. like, everybody jokes, that's the big joke in, uh, uh, the Not Another Teen Movie is, oh, how could she possibly be viewed as ugly? She's never viewed as ugly. They never bring that up in the movie. They just say that she's a catastrophe, you know, that she's a clumsy, you know, uh, you know, uh, outspoken, uh, difficult to deal with and, and and that makes sense um i don't know why for some reason they said oh she's ugly and they just took the glasses off she's gorgeous that's not the point of her character or what the the yeah you know. um but uh with this i'm looking really quick and it looks like she went more of the independent route a lot of it's independent stuff so maybe that's it and she, then she went the hallmark movie route too yeah that's the kind of sucky because well i mean everything you look at was unique and different from the last thing unlike where freddie prince jr was repeating himself over and over and sure he got like six studio films whereas she didn't but she also didn't repeat herself because i'm looking like she did the bubble Fee Fl- the bumblebee flies away which i i can't believe i even remember that movie but i know you liked it uh get carter uh, antitrust it ha- what's that yeah did that one did that movie have uh elijah wood in there it did that's why i liked it because i had that phase with him forever yeah 
uh, Texas Rangers, Josie and the Pussycats, and then that's when it started to turn into much, much smaller independent movies. But I gotta tell you, if you're out with a studio film, you go out with Josie and the Pussycats. Yeah, maybe. It's a fucking great movie. We did that one last year. Um, I've, I've seen a lot of this stuff, though. That Into the West miniseries was really good in 2005. That's, you know, a lot of uh, video game voices. Kingdom Hearts. Nancy Drew. Oh, I like that movie, too. <laughs> I just started thinking about this. <laughs> this is my demented mind. But so they've done she's all that, he's all that, and then they should do they're all that where it's conjoined twins. <laughs> this messed up. Yeah. <laughs> um when I watch this now, I see absolutely one hundred percent Paul Walker's a star. He knows how to own that camera. His ability to just steal a scene away from everybody on that screen. And not because he was a damn fancy, handsome man. He he was a star. And I'm glad that somebody finally saw it with Fast and Furious. Yeah. I, I mean, I definitely know what you mean. Like, the whole thing is just, you're just like, whoa. Yeah. It's, and a lot of it, pretty. a lot of it really, and yes, it is part of the cinematographer, but it also the actor, if they know how to work the camera to, you know, and turn in certain ways uh, and present uh, their performance that way, it really, like, when you're watching the movie, your eyes are automatically drawn to him. Uh, Steve McQueen had that quality um, because even when he didn't have dialogue, he, he was always doing stuff with his hands or his mouth or something like that so that the audience was looking at him. And Brad Pitt has the same thing. Um, certain actors know how to own the camera, and, I mean, it just makes sense of all the people in this movie – to be taken up to, I guess, the A-list, Paul Walker was the one. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. Kevin, Kevin Pollock's my A-list. Oh, Kevin Pollock is so good at this. Point. I know. <laughs> my, I my, love him. <laughs> my favorite scene is when he's watching Jeopardy. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. And all of a sudden, he stops when one of the other kids answers the question. He's like, hey, who are you people? Why are you in my house? <laughs> How long you been it's here? It's just so funny because he's like one not paying attention to the fact that there's a million people in his house at the moment, and two, he's answering every question incorrectly, and three, he notices the people when someone else actually answers the the, the, the question right. <laughs> not until then. <laughs> it's the, it's, I just, uh, he's so funny. What I like about this is, uh, look, there of course there's obviously bad shit from the Weinstein's. Um, you know, uh, they destroyed lives and destroyed movies. Um, but mm -hmm. one thing I will say is that they took care of their actors. If you did a movie for them, they almost always packaged their movies after that, and they were looking at who they previously cast. You know, Anna Paquin was mm -hmm. already working with them. Um, uh, Usher was just in The Faculty. Kieran Culkin and um, Eldon Henson were just in The Mighty. And I don't know if Kevin yeah. Pollock was any movies, but that's that's what they did. They were they were looking around for actors that they had already put in projects, and they had packaged them together. So for like five, ten years there, they were constantly reusing these actors. I, I love that kind of repertory company. You know the way they do with theaters. Yeah, they do that yeah. with their movies, and I really appreciate that. I cause... mean, like British everything in, in like British entertainment is like that. Yeah. What What's the actress that she was in the faculty? Uh, oh. Dang it, she she's not particularly known. Where is she? Clea Duvall. Um, she's never been really a lead, but I think every performance that she's ever done, she's really good. And they give her something very small in this. When I saw this, because I had just seen The Faculty like the month before, and she yeah. had a much bigger role in that, and I was looking at her going, wait, you're going to do this itty-bitty nothing role? And then as an adult now, I see, oh no, that was only five minutes at most, but it was meaty. It was a really important thing for her to say. Yeah. No, I mean, I think it definitely uh, <clears throat> kind of sets the tone for, I don't know, like, the quality of people that you're dealing with in life and, uh, you know, is, is, is a comment on wealth and how that doesn't make you a quality human being, you know, it, yeah. it does a lot of things, but... You're right, it was a little thing, but it was a lot. I'm looking here, it also, uh, I didn't realize that Josh Hartnett was originally considered to be the lead, for the lead, 
and that Mina Savari, yeah. Lily Sobieski, and Jordana Brewster were also signed uh, uh, were on the list or whatever people they're looking at for uh, Lainey. Can you list those people again? Uh, Lily Uh Yeah, Mina Savari, Lily Sobieski, and Jordana Brewster. So I was stretching my and neck, and I think I kind of mumbled. I think I could see Jordana Brewster, maybe, but the other ones, I don't know. Yeah. Well, me... Mm, no, I still see all of them, the ability, but also, like, the performance. So visually, yeah, I can see them pulling it off. Um, there is a weird-ass cameo in this by Sarah Michelle Gellar, who doesn't say a word. Yes, I it's know! Pepper? 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 And she just waves him off. I was like, at, well, she must have been dating Freddie at that time, and she was just on set that day. <laughs> Uh, I think it was this. It, it might have been the same school that they filmed Buffy. Oh, something. I don't know if that's true, but I think I had seen something about some comment about that. Uh, but now I don't remember what the reasoning was. But yeah, uh, wait, filmed at the same high school as Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Huh. This is uh, not who I thought polished the script. I really, for some reason, I was under the impression that Carrie Fisher had done some work on this, but it was M. Night Shyamalan, of all people, not known for jokes. Uh, well, y'all got, everybody's got to start somewhere? I don't know. Signs is hilarious. <laughs> where do you, see, where do you, do, oh, I see it, oh, I see it, in 2013, M. Night Shyamalan, uh, how strange. Now well, he I was... He was working for Miramax. He had done that movie with um, Rosie O'Donnell like two years prior. So I guess that's where he got the script job. Uh. Uh-huh. The the one where she's like a nun or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I don't remember what it's called. It's something oh. wake. Something wake. I can't remember. But um, wide awake. Wide awake. That might be it. Um, also, a small cameo by Chris Owen, who was in like all of these movies back then. Yeah. He doesn't uh-huh, have much yeah. to do. But, uh, boy, I, you remember him forever by eating pubes on a pizza. <laughs> and wasn't he the one in uh, <clears throat> Can't Hardly Wait where he steals the oh, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. gumball machine? Yeah, and he's an American Pie. He was in Angus. Uh, you know, he was just in a handful of those team movies, but it seemed like he was around a lot during that time. And apparently Milo Ventimiglia is in this as a soccer player, and I, I don't remember seeing him at all. Can't say that I was on the lookout for him. Yeah, I didn't realize until the credits. Um, you know that scene with uh, the beatnik kind of performance art thing. Yes. 100%. Have you ever actually seen this, or is this bullshit you just see in movies? Because I've never even heard of this happening in real life. Like art performance. I've never seen anybody go up on stage with some sort of avant-garde uh, beatnik poetry uh, performance art. I never I mean it's because of where we've raised you know Indiana's not known for that but I just like that's I keep seeing that in movies but <laughs> I've never actually seen it in real life. Um, I have no idea but I'm gonna guess that it uh, might maybe just maybe happens in real big cities when people are real bored. Maybe. Um uh, Dulé Hill, baby Dulé Hill, looking so thin and tiny. Um, I love Dulé Hill. <laughs> I love how he just looks at some people like you're fucking idiots. <laughs> like when uh, Matthew Lillard gets in his face <laughs> during the dance. Oh my god. Um, but Gabrielle Union uh, still looks the same. I think she was about 26 here. Exactly the same. Looks exactly yep, the she same. She looks 26 now. I, I have know, no idea amazing. how she does it. Um, and uh, Anna Paquin. Kind of wasted and thrown away in this one, but since she was yeah. already a Miramax person, I think they probably just gave her a good chunk of cash. Said, "Hey, you just work for like three days and you're good." They're so like, "You won an Oscar when you were like 11, so we're just gonna keep giving you money." Yeah. Um, just- plot wise, yeah. it is kind of by the numbers, but what works is the weirdo comedic bits and the character interaction i think is what i mean it is a it is a what is it it's a pygmalion story right just adapted to modern day uh what's the yeah. movie? what's the uh-huh. my fair lady is that it's the same yeah. story uh-huh. so yeah, yeah. so uh, that's nothing new but i think it's how all the characters interact in the goofy little bits that really work with this movie yeah i was gonna say too that um this <laughs> This is just strange connection between our two movies. The falafel restaurant uh, that she oh. was in was also in 
was in the movie Lover Boy. It's the same one. I guess is that the, it's the same restaurant. Did he work there? Well, in Lover Boy, he worked at a pizza. Guy. He was a pizza delivery guy, but they sure do look the same. It says it's the same restaurant from Lover Boy. Okay. Uh, how okay. strange is that? Okay. Huh. And how 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 strange that of all the people in this movie. The one that that theoretically is having the most like success right now is Kieran Culkin, who walked away so many times. Like he'll do a performance, knock you on your right? ass, and disappear for years. That's the craziest thing about him. So listen, I think he's a great actor. Still to this day, like okay, I saw Igby goes down at the theater because I am such a turd, such a nerd, and I still think it's a fantastic movie. And- and he's, he's amazing. And now he's on, you know, Succession or whatever, which everyone talks about. I haven't seen. But, you know, getting nominated for all these awards, people are talking about him all the time, and he just, like, hosted SNL. Yeah. Well, didn't he do Igby Goes Down and then disappeared for eight years, and then all of a sudden shows up in, um, uh, what's up? Damn it, the, the was, uh, something versus the universe. Oh. It, the, the, uh, he you, plays Scott the room- Pilgrim? Scott Pilgrim Scott versus Pilgrim? Spot, Scott Pilgrim versus I mean, the world, um, and I think he, maybe, yeah. he he's not the lead, but there was like an eight year gap there, no. and he gives a kick ass performance and then disappeared again. Yeah, I just he's such a mystery to me, but I just it, I find it like delightfully like amu- delightfully amusing that he just keeps popping up and gets all this buzz. I think it's great. Yeah. Well, and here's the other thing. The movie really does kind of skirt around the obvious characters. Like, he has has hearing aids in this movie, correct? Yes, he does. But they never really bring it up. And they never really bring up the fact that Eldon Henson's character is heavy. Or in these movies, they're always like, oh, she has the fat friend or the gay friend. You know, and they never Mm -hmm. bring that up. And there's so many things they could have, like... They never make any of the characters. There's a joke in uh, not another teen movie that you know uh, Dulé Hill's character is the token black guy. Um, yeah. But in this, a lot of these movies do this lazy thing where they have the one guy who says really hip, cool, you know, uh, gangsta things, whatever. But at no point does Dulé Hill ever do that. He's just a normal dude. The race is never part of it. Yeah. 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 I think it's, this. It, you know. It's a it's a it's a a great thing, and it should be a thing where, like I don't know, being being hard of hearing, you know, having a disability or you know of some kind, or being overweight or being gay or whatever. Like it should not have to be a hundred percent of their character. Like there's more to people than that one thing. We're right. all very complicated human beings. Well, even think of Clea and- Duvall. Any other movie, her character would have been in those vapid valley, you know, uh, pretty girls. And that's not her character. Her character is that she's spoiled and rich and, and an asshole. That's it. But that's not usually how you cast that. Yeah. No, I know what you mean. And I also like the fact that Zach, in any other movie, could have been played as, like, dumb. He's pretty but dumb. That's why he's the polar opposite of Laney. No. He's a jock. But he's not, like, a big beefy guy. And he's also, like, a very good student. His problem in his family is that he has too many options for these big schools. And his father is trying to force him to go to this one. Yeah, basically, he's a he's a 17, 18-year-old guy who doesn't quite know who he is or his place in the world. Like, what's the, what's the crime in that? Yeah. He's trying to figure his shit out. And you know what? Most 18-year-olds don't know. Yeah, I think the only that's character really- in this that's a cliche is Jodie Lynn O'Keefe as Taylor Vaughn. Yeah. Hers yeah. is very just flat and and it gives her nothing really to do except the obvious. And that's what she did. What's the what's the other movie? Whatever it takes she, is basically the same movie, character. Huh? Most of her roles are like that, it seems like to me. Yeah, because even in H, she, uh, she did Halloween H two O before this, and she's also just a throwaway nothing. She really didn't. She's a talented actress. I'm not saying she's great, but I'm saying she probably deserved better than what she was given. Yeah, I mean, I just <coughs> excuse me. Yeah, I just feel like she played the same thing all the time. I mean, maybe that's not true. 
because she did I, I guess she has done a lot of stuff you know as as an adult later on yeah well she was I in haven't she was in Nash was Bridges it? for like seven years, and I don't remember that's what, what her. Face. She was Nash Bridges' daughter, right? Yeah, I don't remember what her character was on that show, and maybe she was picking uh, stuff that was polar opposite of that. I don't know. Maybe hard yeah. to say. But I think all but in just, all, these two she movies wasn't given a lot of good options. No, but all in all, I think both of these movies held up very well. They're much better than their their. Well, I guess Can't Buy Me Love never really got any bad buzz, but She's All That is seriously underrated. Yeah, I do think it it gets picked on a lot. Obviously, especially because they made that up that you know not another teen movie or whatever, and used a lot of it. Yeah, and but I I appreciate that this is kind of a I mean the trend started a little bit earlier with Can't Hardly Wait, but P, studios actually putting real money into these teen movies instead of making them for absolutely nothing generic garbage the problem is is hardly anybody followed the pattern after she's all that they followed the pattern of um american pie where it was really low budgets uh nothing interesting visuals and and just getting a lot of no names in a couple that you recognize and that was it and then playing to the lowest common denominator i i am actually kind of nervous about revisiting american pie because i feel like i'm going to be cringing a lot Mm, well that's quite possible the, he does That's fuck the a pie, about... and, then, and and I'm I'm yeah. concerned about the whole thing where he films her without her permission, which is actually a crime, and and stuff like that. And so many movies after that copied the American Pie format instead of the other. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff in in movies, especially teen movies. What? I'm sorry, I'm reading about Jodie Leno Keith, and it says, was once engaged to her Nash Bridges co-star, Don Johnson. That can't be right. No, she was she was engaged to the other guy. Uh, not Don Tommy, Johnson. Not huh? No, no, there was a much younger okay. guy with brown hair and has spiky brown hair. He was part of another team okay. that worked with Nash. Okay, I'll believe you. Yeah. I, it does seem wrong and confusing. Yeah, that's okay. fucked up. Anyway. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of stuff that happened in, in teen movies, uh, that's really, really, I mean, well, there's cringe and then there's just like, that's a crime. Yeah. So I think that's it for this. I don't know what we're doing after this cause I don't even remember where we are with our list. So I'm not going to say nope. what we're planning on, but, uh, thank you very much everybody for listening and Mindy, thank you for another great episode. You're welcome, sir. All right, check us out on Facebook and Twitter at Hit Rewind Podcast and all your subscribing services for podcasts. Please sign up there and share. And that is it for tonight, everybody. Have a good night.